So let's begin with your first meeting with my Zetterling. Yeah, I was um, I was working in my cutting room at uh, a company I had a, um, a directorship with, Document Films, in Soho in London. And um, next door was uh, another editor, who was a real old friend of mine, Terry Twig. And he had been cutting a film in the BBC series, One Pair of Eyes. Um, One Pair of Eyes was a series that took prominent people and gave them a platform to say more or less whatever they wanted, within reason. And Mai had been selected to do one of these films. And she said she'd only do it um, on condition that she could do a short mini-movie, around about eight minutes, I think, which she would uh, direct and edit herself and would be dropped into the, the middle of the film. So Terry and his director, Peter Cantor, made themselves a scarce, while Mai wrestled with the editing equipment next door to me. Well, of course, time and again, things would go completely out of sync or she'd get in a complete knot or something, and uh, there'd be a little knock at the door. It would, do you think you could just help me a minute? And this um, went on several times. Um, I thought no more about it. Um, uh, of course, I was quite flattered to be asked to uh, help out with somebody so distinguished. But it was, I was really knocked sideways when some weeks later she came back and asked me to cut her film Vincent the Dutchman about Van Gogh. Um, she told me that she just knew, she just knew I was the right person to do this. But I later found out she'd asked everybody, um, Tom, Dick and Harry, around the business as to what I was like and what my work was like. Um, but we started it, I think, in, in, in January 1972. And uh, I was, uh, as you can imagine, fairly nervous and working for such an experienced director with several uh, feature films under her belt. And um, we started We started on the sequence where uh, Van Gogh encounters a lady herding goats and looks very quizzically and closely at her and she really gets upset and tells him to go away and uh, with the goats all milling around. Anyway, we, we, we saw the rushes together and she left me to do it. And um, later on I came back and, you know, my heart was in my mouth. That, but she saw it and she was so over the moon that it was, it was, it was great. It was, um, uh, you know, I knew we were perhaps on the, on the right track. Uh, she had tried to cut it herself, but there again she'd, uh, she'd found the actual technical... Um, business of handling film and the cutting equipment uh, difficult to um, master so uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that I'm sure she probably had, had um, budgeted for doing it herself so um, perhaps engaging an editor editor was um, another bit of cost that wasn't uh, factored into the original plan but she had a, an interest in all aspects of filmmaking. Oh, very much so. Yeah, I mean, perhaps she... editing was the last uh, challenge she decided to tackle. Um, <laughs> and, and... Yes, uh, she she certainly had a a very strong sense of editing and rhythm and knowing the possibilities of editing. Um, I was very struck when I saw the, the mini-movie that she was making um, for the One Pair of Eyes film, that uh, it was rhythmically very strong, as I remember it. It, 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 it increases in pace throughout that at eight minutes, 
um, the juxtapositions, like um, Joss Ackland, the main actor, the husband, um, spitting into the lavatory and it cut to uh, an egg being uh, broken into a frying pan. It just <laughs> it's wonderful. Um, and the sound in that eight-minute movie is also quite jarring. Yes, it is. It's slammed doors and um, I, can't, I can't remember it all that well. But Weapons uh, being shot off. Oh, really? Yes, yes. News items being stridently... That's right, yes, pronounced. yes, yes. Uh, yes, I could be more um, forthcoming if I'd seen it recently. So you've indicated also in our correspondence that she uh, was very sympathetic and understanding of an editor's job and and welcomed contributions by an editor. Yes, yes, definitely. And what were some examples of that with um, your work with her? Well, in Vincent, they're only small, but... Um, uh, when Van Gogh is working amongst the sunflowers, he looked up at the <clears throat> sky and to the, almost to, into the sun and, and uh, blinked like that, closed his eyes a moment. Um, John Bulmer had been filming separately um, close-ups of sunflowers, and at one point he decided his aperture was too wide and he stopped down with the lens. Unfortunately, he he rotated the lens ring the wrong way, and just for a moment, he he overexposed and then pulled it back again. So it meant you had a great flash of white behind this this big close up of a sunflower. And I found that by taking what is in fact a cameraman's mistake, and just for something like five frames, putting it into the moment where. Um, Michael Goff, the actor, looked up at the sun. Uh, you've got this tremendous sort of um, uh, ambivalent um, image, really, both sunflower and sun, and then he, he screws up his eyes. And I'm rather, rather pleased to sort of find that and, and, and make that a part of the sequence. It's a tiny detail, but it, uh, my liked it, it stayed in. Um, don't know what a. Uh, There's a gramophone. Oh well, yes. In the broth <clears throat> yes. scene. Yes, she wanted to. She didn't know how to end the the um, the broth the brothel scene. She said, in some ways, it needs music. And I had this lovely old horn gramophone from about 1905 vintage. And I found um, uh, a record, I think, of around about 1915 vintage. I know this, uh, this was really um, far too late for uh, the time that we were uh, chronicling for Van Gogh's life, but it, she didn't matter. So um, we got Bulmer to, to film the the... the record rotating on the, on the machine and the pickup. Um, we played the, um, the old recording uh, right through the sequence and at the end of the sequence the, uh, the needle runs off the record and it, it, it brought the sequence to a, a, a good end, I think. Um, but that was, well, that's my suggestion. That, uh, and the other thing, I think, was when she wanted... Uh, when Van Gogh is going mad and the nuns are approaching him, she wanted the sound of nuns singing, but she wanted it to sound weird. And I found that by transferring the music of nuns singing to a quarter-inch tape, I then had a, a machine that would alter the speed of that tape. So we re-recorded it onto film with the with um, the speed of the tape going up, which meant that it left the key that it was normally in and just in a mad musical way just ascended. And it, it, it gave the right 
right strange feeling to that sequence. So how do you compare your working with my Zetterling as a director to working with other directors? I th- don't think I've ever worked with many people that have such a clear vision of what she wanted almost from the start. Um, uh, uh, yes. Um, the, I mean, the good thing was that certainly... Definitely after after Vincent, we we found that we were both fairly fairly well in accord with one another, and that helps. I mean, I I'm not awfully keen on doing what I would call rescue jobs in editing. Um, what I like is somebody like Mai, who has a good um, sense of what she wants initially, and produces rushes that are are interesting and full of possibilities and basically would make a good film anyway. And then you, you, you add your own skills on top, which hopefully will take it to a slight improvement. So you enjoyed your work with her? I did, yes. There were times when, um, we, we used to, uh, get um, rather testy with one another but that was usually when it was very late at night you know midnight or one o'clock in the morning and we um, just tiredness set in and uh, <laughs> I don't have to really explain that I mean I, I actually he did actually tell me that um I think it was because I probably uh, voiced an opinion as to whether it worked or not because uh-huh. there was a I felt probably wrongly that it it slightly held up the film uh, after a while you got really into into um Michael Gough um articulating the agony of 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 you know the white hot um, moment of creation for Van Gogh as he st- stuff down things on his canvases um and um it seemed to it seemed to me to interrupt the film a bit but um so you've spoken several times about john bulmer mm. the uh he did the cinematography basically yes on this film and it was his first was it not i think it was i think it how was how did she come to choose john bulmer Oh, I think because um, John has a, as a stills photographer, has a very acute eye. Um, and she was familiar with his work. Yes, I think I think um, David and John were were friends. Um, uh, um, I mean, you see, I, <clears throat> by the time I I um, got to know my, I think Vincent was already shot. Right. Most of it. Yes, it must have been. Mm. It was her was mm. it her first foray into colour? Ah. Oh, um Her features of the sixties were all in black and white. Yes, the uh the war game, which was a little short film, that was in black and white. Yes. It's just possible it was her first um foray into colour. And as an industry person, uh help us out. Was that the era when color? Well, no, color was <clears throat> no, color. Then. Color, color television started in. Let me think. It started in about nineteen sixty-eight in Britain. Okay. Um, uh, I know that because I would uh, I was editing another film which could have been the first in color, but maybe was the last in black and white. Um. Uh, now you you asked me about how she dealt with colour. Um, I think that sort of um, question is more applicable to a, uh, a feature film where you've got designers and costumes and so on. I think, um, apart from the fact that obviously 
colour is during the uh, the spring and summer in in the south of France. Wonderful, and you've got the field of poppies. You have the the um, sunflower fields in wonderful golden colours. Um, so I don't think there was much uh, design work. Most of it is the most of the film is is exterior, as I remember. Um, you n- mentioned that the film Vincent the Dutchman was shot mostly in the golden hours of dawn and dusk. That's right. Yes. Do you think this contributed to its beauty? Then? Very much so. Yes, very much so. Yes. Um, Yes, it's, uh, you know, when shapes tend to stand out more with the um, l- the more directional light. Um, uh, it's a softer light, too. I mean, it's pretty pretty harsh and unforgiving in, at midday in, uh, in the south. Um, parts of it, obviously, were shot uh, in the middle of the day. As I say, the poppies and the, and the sunflowers, I think, were shot... Uh, um, somewhere in the middle of the day. You mentioned uh, also that two scenes were removed from this. Yes. Film. <clears throat> in the, right. <laughs> in the sequence where um, Michael Goff is uh, cutting his hair, um, dyeing his beard trying to get more to look like Van Gogh and to get into the sort of workman's spirit of the thing. My shot, it was a long shot, and <laughs> Michael has... Michael is is um, having a crap under a almond tree. A crap? Uh, yes. he's <laughs> He's got his trousers around his ankles... <laughs> It's, you just see the outline of a bare bottom, no more than that. He's, uh, um, I, th- I think he's just got a, some pieces of torn up newspaper in his hand and he just uh, applies one to his, his bottom and pulls up his trousers, stands up, shakes the almond tree and all the blossoms flutter down. Post crap. <laughs> That's right, Yes. <laughs> And I just thought this was wonderful. It was just so. And she had of, the camera on because. Oh, it was directed. I mean, it was. Oh, no, it was no, directed. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I no, 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 no. He wasn't really doing it. Sorry. I mean, this is this is a scene that she'd set up. And, I see. Uh, yeah. Oh God. Sake. <laughs> no. Um, but um, the American producers thought that was quite indecent and <laughs> insisted it went. She was a bit upset about that. So it was an American co- uh, American produced. Uh, it was, I think, a co-production between BBC Two and um, uh, I don't remember who the uh, the American producers were. Uh, but it was a co-production. American yes, it was. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you mentioned also that the final dancing scene. Yes, I mean it's they they. All the characters that appeared as um, the whores, the postman, the doctor, all those artists um, were gathered together at a a final party at the Mass. The the Alice Band, town band, marches up the, uh, the, the path to the house. And then there was a, a very brief sequence of everybody sort of jiving away to this this band. And I fear that the um, producers found it a bit embarrassing with all these older people sort of uh, um, bopping away. <laughs> and they didn't like it, so they, they asked for that to go. So it's, it's slightly... Um, it's a pity because the... You don't quite know why uh, the, the band comes up to the house. There are a few close-ups of some of the leading characters with drinks in their hand, and then Michael Goff wanders away from it and up um, 
out to the... As Van Gogh. That, well, no, as himself As now. himself. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, she had a party scene or two in so many. Did she? <laughs> yes. 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 So it might have uh, changed it quite a bit, or changed her intention to eliminate a party scene. One would think. Yes. Um, yes, I think it was a pity that it had to go. Um, but there you go. And they cut a gory close-up from the bullfight. So. That's the BBC, yes, so I got very sensitive about um, animal welfare. Yeah, so even at that time, I think I think I think it's I think it's still in the in the main copy, but I think they probably um, cut it out on tape when before they transmitted it. In this film, finally, she insisted uh, on a credit title that was unusual. Yes, very. Made yes. by John Bulmer, Michael Guth, David Hughes, Edward Roberts, Mai Zetterling. Uh, in her autobiography, All Those Tomorrow, she describes the making of this film uh, as a collective, in a way. Uh, did you... Yes, I think, I think it's pr- she's probably right in that, in that I think everybody sort of was allowed to have their... Um, their um, two penneth of of, of uh, opinion in it, and um, um, certainly John Bulmer said there was a lot of um, a lot of arguments as to what to choose to shoot. Um, uh, uh, not arguments, but a discussion amongst the group. Um, so maybe, maybe she, she yes. This one was, was more of a collaboration. More of a collaboration than the normal. I mean, they were all living down at the mass. I wasn't. I, mean, I was, uh, didn't come into it until the whole thing had been shot. Um, well, not quite. I know that I'd started cutting before the opening sequences in, in Holland had been shot, but they, they arrived. They were shot in the early spring, I think, with still a bit of snow on the ground. and So I would have been... Uh, Involved in the cutting, um, uh, would have cut some of it by then. Anyway, um, yes, I mean, they, they, uh, Michael and John and probably Angela as well were staying down at the mass, and um, Mai was uh, cooking away and feeding them all and um, helping to make the costumes. And uh, I think she did do a massive amount of. Um, um, work to uh, get get the look of the film right. And how is this film received then, Vincent the Dutchman, by audiences it, and critics? It, oh, I think it was it was um, oh, it was very well received. It won it won the best specialized TV film of the year award at what was to become BAFTA. It was called the Society of Film and Television Arts in those days. Um, uh, which was, you know, for, for as far as British people were concerned, that was quite a, quite a big award. Um, I think it got very respectful reviews, uh, from what I remember. And um, uh, was she uh, in London? To accept the award? Or? No, she wasn't, <clears throat> nor was... <coughs> excuse me. Um, she was not uh, in London, and I don't think David Hughes was, or John Bulmer, or Michael Goff. And, um, so um, I got a phone call saying, would I go and pick up the award, which was... Um, well, it was a good good evening. Um, it was... Uh, the awards were presented by Princess Anne, at the um, at the Royal Albert Hall, um, and uh, no, it was um, yeah, it was a pleasure to be able to do that. Yes, we were talking about uh, her relationship with David Hughes and mm. how their partnership 
affected uh, her career and the films that she made. Um, and how do you think that manifests? Um, yes, I think I think David had um, a tremendous. Uh, he was a tremendous provider of reassuring support in all so many ways. Um, I can't talk about the the Swedish feature films um, because I didn't know her then, but certainly on the first film that we were involved with, which was Vincent the Dutchman, um, he certainly had a very strong hand in suge suggesting the um, the order of the sequences. It was he who read through the letters of Van Gogh and uh, suggested the way the film might go um, so that it uh, could be supported by the narrative that the, the letters provided. Um, uh, he... <laughs> Is he recorded the sound on that um, that particular film, and he he wrote uh, the dialogue and the the final commentary. Um, that, that's all his work, certainly. After mm. Vincent the Dutchman, she made. A film called *The Strongest*, which was part of the *Visions of Eight* series <coughs> for the Olympics of 1972 in Munich. Uh, you edited that film. Yes. And uh, you described in our correspondence the uh, camera work that was done for that <coughs> film, which yeah. was quite elaborate. Yes, it was. Well. Um Runa Eriksson did did most of the photography. Um, uh, we covered a lot of the the leading um, weightlifters in um, training, um, and uh, and she was she was also very f fascinated by the fact that. Um, the the German organisers of the Olympics were were keen to uh, promote all the work that had gone into those Olympics, the amount of food that would have been bought, the the various things that had been loaned from the armed forces. Um, a whole series of statistics came over the uh, the tannoys around the Olympic Village, um, and this I think um, sparked a uh, um, the idea is for an element of counterpoint in the whole thing. Now, Runa, Runa covered all those um, on his camera, but in the fi when the final uh, event happened, we covered it, I think, with eight cameras altogether. So we had, um, it was very, very fully covered indeed. Uh, a lot of footage. It's a lot of footage. The shooting ratio, and this is on 35mm Eastman colour, uh, was something like 40 to 1. Um, uh, yes, it took a lot of, a lot of handling. Um, um, and 40 to 1 would be what? Three or four times more than normal? Yes, at that time, a BBC um, documentary budget would, would be um, assuming something like between 12 and 15 to 1 ratio and that would be on 16 millimeter which would be cheaper so it was it was it was huge yes yeah um, you say she was fascinated by the grotesque nature of this particular sport in a lot of the interview in, in one interview uh, she said to the press, I'm not interested in sports, I'm interested in obsessions. Mm. And this is why she chose weightlifters as her uh, topic, uh, as the sport she would do a film about. Um, she seems to have this interest in the grotesque and the, even to the extent of off-color 
things. Is, how else did you? Find yes, them? I think I think that's absolutely right. That um, uh, I th- I think, although I don't think I actually heard her say it, but I think she felt that sort of lifting huge weights above one's head was was almost sort of a pointless activity, and the fact that these. Uh, particularly the the heavyweight weightlifters um, ate such an enormous amount of food just to be able to do this uh, one extraordinary thing. Um, uh, um, and that was indicated in the film. The film had food in. It. I think so. Yes, I I did I did say, did you not shoot? anything of the uh, the weightlifters eating all this food. And she said, no, that would have been too obvious. And I think she was absolutely right in retrospect. The food the food shots play as a counterpoint to all this, this effort and, and banging of, of the barbells as they go down. And um, it, it's a... She shoots the food uh, uh, warehouses, does she not? Or no, try. Well, she shot the butchers. Uh, the yes, butcher. that's right. With with huge carcasses. That's right. With huge, the cold car- storage that's right, with huge carcasses uh, being wheeled through. Uh, and, uh, Prior to their being. I cooked. think. I think because she was so keen on the finer aspects of cuisine, she just found it slightly offensive. All this just mass of mass of chicken legs, masses of eggs, masses of meat. Just, just the. She found that in itself sort of grotesque. And this uh, feeds into her using the soundtrack of the announcements over the PA systems of the statistics. That's right. Of everything that. Yes, that's right. That yes, particular yes, Olympics. Has. Yes, yes. Uh, did the political event at that 1972 Munich Olympics of the. Israeli assassinations. I remember the situation. Yes, um, I remember coming back and saying how shocked she was, but I don't think it happened anywhere near where she was filming. And indeed, I I don't know whether most of the filming was complete when when that happened. Um, it didn't impinge on the film ma- making itself anyway. And how long was the film? Uh, I don't know how long the whole feature runs, which is eight essays from eight different directors, but um, her section ran, I think, about 12 minutes. Yes. Um, I think everybody was asked to do 12 minutes, but um, John Schlesinger and his editor, Jim Clark, um, did the final section on the uh, marathon intercut with the um, uh, attack on the Israeli athletes which um, concluded the film I see you mentioned that there was a sequence of Precious Mackenzie the British flyweight practicing lifts and that it couldn't be included because it was too beautiful. Yes, um, uh, it was one of the... Uh, I think it was one of the early, early things that we cut, and it took us something like four days to get it right. Um, I, I would go back just a stage to say that um, my, I think, had a very good concept of the shape of this 12 minute film right from the start so we did um unlike van gogh we did start at the beginning and work through logically to the to the end um and precious mckenzie's lifting he he is a man in the in the the beginning of the film which you see with his hands behind his necks jumping through the um the empty uh practice area and jumping up something like um, six fl- six steps um, uh, and um, so 
he was going to introduce the idea of the band, the German band, practising all the national anthems. And we intercut this, the band and Mackenzie. And I suppose partly it's because he's he was a flyweight, he was a small man, he wasn't huge, he wasn't grotesque. Um, and it just didn't have that sort of wayward special feel that um, Mai was looking for. Wayward? Well, <laughs> perverse. <laughs> she did have an interest in the yeah. perverse. Uh, I mean, it was clever of them to shoot the, the band itself with just eyes seen behind the, the instruments, um, uh, faces just half glimpsed through brass and uh, all carefully set up by... Well, I say it's carefully set up. I think they, as far as the first time we see the band... I think she asked them to perform the, uh, what was I think, the Belgian national anthem um, twice so that she could get a full coverage of all the um, details in the orchestra without us uh, being short of material. You were not short of material, it sounded like. I don't think I was. <laughs> After you did the first two uh, projects with my The Vincent the Dutchman and The Strongest of the series Visions of Aid of the Munich Olympics in 1972, your next editing project with my Zetterling was Stockholm, a film in the Canadian Cities series. Can you tell us something about that experience with her? Um... Yes. Uh, Cities was made by a Canadian company called Nielsen Ferns, um, and the director was a, a man called John McGreevy. And um, he had signed up various notable authors from each country, to, to uh, from a variety of countries, rather, to... Uh, produce a portrait of their own city of, of birth, or at least the cities that they felt uh, closest to. Um, and uh, there was a lot of um, interesting people besides Mai. There was um, uh, Peter Ustinov, who said he had it on very good authority that uh, he was conceived in Leningrad, um, even if he hadn't lived there. Um, and there was Jonathan Miller in London, and there was Elie Wiesel in Jerusalem, George Plimpton in New York. Anyway, um, Mai was engaged to do a portrait of Stockholm. Mai being Mai, of course, wouldn't just do you a sort of standard um, tourist trip around her hometown. She... Um, she brought history into it and cast herself in certain sequences as Queen, the 17th century Queen Christina of Sweden. And she donned a little moustache and beard and appeared as August Strindberg. <laughs> um, I don't remember a lot about the cutting. I think it was fairly straightforward. Um, uh, she was the only person I'd one of the um, the authors that actually uh, came to the cutting room. The, the rest of the series was directed by um, John McGreevy himself. Um, uh, but um, So you edited the entire series? No, I didn't edit the entire series. No, I edited, I, I don't know, about half a dozen films possibly out of it, um, yes. Um... In fact, I think I, I think uh, we did one session of four or five films, and then a sort of year later, John arrived with another lot. So um, uh, it's not. I'm not awfully clear about that. So she came to the cutting. But room. she came to the cutting. Room, yes. No. No. We worked together like um, you know we had before. Um, 
Do you think mm. she'd felt uh, a closeness to Sweden uh, in spite of the fact that she didn't live there? What was in her? some ways, yes. In some ways, no. Um, uh, I think, I think that for her character, Sweden was just a place that was too ordered, too secure, too um, um, running on straight parallel lines. Didn't give her the sort of uh, sense of freedom and wildness that she craved and I think she made a certain amount of that uh, in, in the film She did have uh, interest in other societies and other cultures and other uh, subcultures even especially in her documentaries such as uh, in of seals and men which yes you also edited yes yes i think um, seals and men was a um uh a, an effort to um remind people who um were against people who hunted um seals and so on that the, here on earth there was a, a society that absolutely depended on on the seal and other things that they could um, uh, rescue from the sea. Um, and so she was determined to sort of go out and show exactly what um, living by um, hunting actually meant. And she went out on the ice with, with, with the Inuit and um, in Greenland and they camped out on the ice, I think, for several nights and re returned to the uh, to the village where the um, she she observed the the way that uh, the seal meat was butchered and the skins cured for um, clothing and all that sort of thing it was a very real look at a possibly dying um, society in that uh, there were there were problems with um, alcohol and interface with developed societies that were always beginning to sort of raise their their head. She camped out on the ice mm -hmm. with uh, the crew, and I think the crew was was her, Runa Eriksson, the cameraman, and and Glenn Grappinay, who did the sound. Mm. And they were out on the ice uh, with seal hunters. Right? That's right, yes, they were. I went out on the dog sleds with them. Um, uh, there was a moment, there is a moment in the film where the ice starts to crack and um, uh, Glenn captured the sound of it, this extraordinary groaning sound that the ice makes when it's about to break up and they had to get off in a hurry. No, it was... Um, how did they manage to uh, safeguard the footage in the film um, in such conditions? I can't answer that, but all I know is I'm, I wasn't aware of very much um, many fogged rolls of film or spoiled rolls of film. They must have, they must have treated it with great care, um, loading and unloading the camera. Um, no, it was it was well shot, and so you had no uh, had no issues with the technical difficulties at all. No, none at all. Um. And after uh, these two projects, Cities and Of Seals and Men, uh, what what more did you work with her on? Um, I in that case it would have been. A little short um, drama film called Sunday Pursuit, um, and which I wish I had seen, been able to see before I talked to you, because I can't remember an awful lot about it. Uh, um, it starred two two very good actors, um, Denham Elliot and Rita Tushingham. Um, uh, 
I'm not sure I can really add anything to this. Um, uh, I, I remember the, 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 the Denim Keller character, um, sorry, the Denim Elliot character was one of these sort of shy loser type men, which my had a kind of. Her fascination with isolated characters was often tempered with a sense of pity. Mm. You wrote that in our correspondence. Yes, yes, what did you mean yes. by that exactly? Uh, well, um, the isolated character being the weightlifter, for example. Yes, the um, yes in, in visions of eight, she she more than once looked at the at the the large Belgian heavyweight uh, lifter and. Uh, she said, he looks so sad, poor man, you know, and I just feel that he's not going to, he's not going to get anywhere. He just, he's, he's, he just, it's written all over his face. And the, um, the character in Sunday Pursuit, she made him have, um, in his flat, she made him have a tray of cactuses to um, which he was watering and she felt that the cactus was the worst kind of plant, you know, <laughs> because she liked sort of big, showy, um, exuberant blooms when she came into flowers. And the cactuses yeah. represented his yes, loneliness. Sort of, that's right, yes, yeah. His bleak. Um, but um, her... <laughs> her... Uh, a humor, sense of humor at um, other people's grubby habits was uh, it came up from time to time. It was, uh, I think, she has it in her autobiography about a man that she used to know. He used to not just pick his nose, but he used to roll it into balls and flick it across the room. Um, she does have a <laughs> passage about a New York stage director when she came to do Hedda Gabler in 1960, and the director. Mm. Picked his nose and ate bagel. <laughs> oh God! Yes. Yeah, well, that's about. It. And the other thing, she she knew somebody from who lived, uh, I don't know, fairly near to the mass, and um, uh, he was sort of well built, uh, middle aged man, and um, he had a bit of a body odor problem. And uh, she said you could see him for about half a mile off, approaching marching along the road to the mass and going <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and you have a note here money for the fair oh that's purely no that's not um, that was regarding my children she used to she came to our house once and, uh, and she said to my boys, right, if you're going to the fair today, you can have all the change in my bag. And she emptied it out and she said to me, God, I didn't realise there was so much. <laughs> no, no, um, she also was amused on the Greenland film by, you know, she said, I, so what about going to the toilet in that? Well, she said you had to... Um, you had to. I, had, I used to go behind a uh, sort of an ice ridge, so it'd be a bit of privacy, and you just had to sort of drop your pants and do it quickly and uh, and pull them up again. And uh, she said, "The trouble is, the minute you'd done it, the dogs came galloping along and gobbled it all up." Imagine <laughs> <laughs> the dogs in that film are quite brutal <laughs> with one another. And, mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think she had a lot of admiration for the dogs that just they just keep running and running and running and they don't stop. Mm. Uh, on occasions, yes, she would um, ask me if I could deal with certain uh, items of expenditure which need, needed negotiation. One was the uh, the ancient record that we used of uh, Wagner in um, Vincent the Dutchman over the brothel scene. A gramophone record. A gramophone record. 
I should think somewhere around um, around 1915 recording. And um, I discovered that EMI still held the copyright. So we had to clear it. So uh, I rang, she said, will you ring them up? Oh, OK, um, fine. So I got onto the department concerned and explained we only wanted um, less than a minute of it. What would they want for, uh, for clearance for that? And they said, um, oh, £25. So I... Um, I think I probably was to put covered the, my hand over the phone and said to her, "They want twenty five pounds. That all right?" Oh no, no, that's far too much. Fine. Well, what do you want to offer? Well, say five pounds. <laughs> so I got back to the man and I said, "Look, um, sorry, twenty five is 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 too much. We can't." Well, he said, um, "What what do you think is a reasonable rate?" So I said. Five pounds? He said, oh, my God. Oh, all right, then. <laughs> and the other time was um, on the, the strongest. We needed to recreate the voices coming over the loudspeakers of all of the um, the statistics that they were broadcasting about the amount of food and the things that we used in the, in the Olympics. And she'd got a, um, a transcript of, of the script. And we need a German voice. OK, will you get me a German voice from an agent? So I got on to a theatrical agent. And um, once again, you know, they want so much. Oh, we can't afford that. <laughs> so I had to... I had to um, rather embarrassed by it all, I had to get back to the agent and say, look, this is what we want to pay, and if you don't want to pay that, we can get a German off the street to just to come and read this in his accent and uh, take it or leave it. I'm not that sort of person anyway. <laughs> they they had no option, but we, we had a young man turned up the next day to, to, to read this into a microphone. So she was a shrewd negotiator as long as she was negotiating through you. But it, well, yes, yes. Others uh, have reported that she had money difficulties. I think she always had money difficulties. She always spent everything before she earned it. Um, she was uh, past master at that, getting one loan, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Um, uh, it was the way that she seemed to handle her life. You have a note here about tax arrangements. She did admit to me once that um, she paid no tax at all because everybody thought she was dom domiciled somewhere else, wherever she was. I mean, I think that was probably c quite common in those days because in days before computers, nobody could keep up with anybody. Um, so perhaps, although it sounds fairly... Uh, shocking in this day and age and I'm sure a lot of people were um, uh, living by that um, by those standards quite happily well being a Swede with such a high tax structure at home she was probably proud of that I would think <laughs> yes 